Hello, my name is Ed Hove. I'm a geotechnical engineer based in Yellowknife. I have lived in the north for over 30 years and have been practicing in terms of foundations on permafrost over that time. The presentation I'll be giving you today is with respect to a study I did on behalf of the Government of the Northwest Territories, Department of Infrastructure. As the title implies, I assessed the capacity of ad freeze pile foundations, but specifically what I was looking at were the implications of projected climate change on capacity going forward. And then in turn, what are the implications for the service life of the buildings? Before we get to the study though, just a little bit of background on ad freeze piles. They have been very commonly used in both the Northwest Territories and Nunavut. They can be used in soils that are quite ice rich, as depicted in that picture, which is from the power station in Polituck. The methodology is that you drill a hole that is oversized, then you put the pipe in and then you backfill it. The slide mentions a sand slurry, and that's a term that's used, but it can be gravel or sand. And it's not so much a slurry as you alternate the gravel with water so that the backfill remains saturated. As long as it's saturated, you get good contact between the pile and the backfill. This type of foundation requires that the permafrost be preserved, so you do require an airspace under the building. And we would typically only count on this type of foundation in permafrost, continuous permafrost. We don't rely on it in areas of discontinuous or worm permafrost. This is just a simple illustration of what it might look like in the ground. The main thing I'm trying to get across here is that you can cut slots in the sides of the piles to increase the friction between the pile and the soil and therefore the capacity of the piles. This is commonly done in the Inuvik area but it's not commonly done in remote communities. Now I'm just going to touch briefly on some theory. I, I provide references if you want to delve into it further but the premise of ad freeze pile design is time dependent settlement. We call it creep settlement. The image shows that there are three fundamental types of creep settlement. If the rate of settlement decreases over time, it's primary creep. If it's consistent over time, as implied by that straight line in the middle, that's termed secondary creep. And if the rate of settlement increases with time, accelerates, that's tertiary creep. Tertiary creep would lead to failure. We try and stay away from that. We try and design for that secondary creep zone so that we have predictable and consistent rate of settlement. In reality, once we then put conservatism into our design, probably we're more in the zone of primary creep. But as you approach the limit of design, we do anticipate a steady state of creep with time. Creep is empirically defined by a logarithmic relationship that has two fundamental parameters to define the relationship. The first is an n value. It's an exponent. It's typically taken as three. There have been some work done to consider if other values are more appropriate, but nothing has really taken hold, and I still use three for design. The second parameter is a b parameter that is dependent on two aspects of the soil. The first is temperature, and the second is salinity. Once you get the salinity value for a site, it's pretty much fixed. But then temperature varies over time, potentially anyway. Um, we vary the B parameter for every site that we do work on. Both of those, temperature and salinity, affect the strength of the permafrost and therefore the capacity of a pile in permafrost. Okay, so now we can talk about the review I did on behalf of the Government of the Northwest Territories. To start, this was precipitated by findings or recommendations from the Auditor General that in terms of the building infrastructure, there hadn't really been enough consideration given to the potential impacts of climate change on the integrity of buildings. There had been in transportation infrastructure, but this review was intended to give some thought to potentially what could happen to buildings and ad freeze piles are obviously something that would potentially be sensitive to warming permafrost. I was provided with a list of all the building assets, some 1,100 buildings, and did an initial screening on two considerations. First, the likelihood that a building would be on ad freeze piles, and then secondly, whether the site would be on sensitive permafrost or on less sensitive permafrost. This table summarizes the number of buildings that fit those two categories, 
So we narrowed it down quite a bit from 1100. Then I met with the Department of Infrastructure and they suggested that we exclude timber pile foundations from the review, reasoning that anything on a timber pile foundation would be an old building and likely near the end of its service life anyway. So there's no point in trying to anticipate what might happen with climate change because those buildings were likely to be replaced soon. Okay, so after we did that, we ended up with 14 buildings and they are listed here. Most of them are in Inuvik. And as you see, there were a couple in Sigachik. Then we started trying to collect information for these identified 14 buildings and very soon three were dropped off the the gray lines near the uh, in the table we just couldn't find uh, enough background information to even start a review we couldn't find drawings we couldn't find geotechnical information that type of thing and then after those three were dropped off i suggested adding two buildings those are the lower two taktaiactic school and fort good hope school mainly we did this because there was information available for those buildings and they were major pieces of infrastructure in, in communities that weren't otherwise represented in the tip in the list. With further review of information, we basically ended up with eight buildings that we felt we could do meaningful reviews on and those are identified in green in the table. Fort Good Hope School was dropped off because with further review, it was determined that the design wasn't based on permafrost at all and it was a conventional driven pile in unfrozen soil. So this is just a quick illustration of the locations of the six buildings that were selected in Inuvik. We'll get to them in a sub subsequent table, so I won't list them all off, but this is just to show you that it covers quite a large area of the main part of the community, that institutional part of the community. It doesn't extend out into the residential or industrial areas of the community. The one building in Tsikachik is shown here. It's the Community Learning Center. And then the Taktayaktuk School is shown here. So for the climate change part of it, I use projections that are provided in the document that is illustrated here. It's a guideline from the Canadian Standards Association. There's general background information in the document as well, both permafrost and its occurrence, and then general descriptions of the foundation types in permafrost areas. But for this study, what was particularly relevant and useful is in chapter four, which discusses past trends in climate and provides projections that you can assume for design. For this review, I chose to use a high scenario. It's referred to as RCP 8.5, that's Representative Concentration Pathway 8.5. This comes from the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Assessment Report 5. Essentially, what the scenario assumes is that emissions are going to continue to grow as they have been, and that there's no effective mitigation. This is potentially considered a conservative assumption in terms of emissions and projected temperatures. But it seems that the actual temperatures track well against this assumed scenario, so that's why I selected it. All our sites are in the Western Arctic sector W2, which I've illustrated. And as you can see, they provide projections over the next 90 years and then with it broken out seasonally. This is what that looks like then for Inuvik. And on this slide, I've shown both historical climate as well as what the projections look like. The RCP 8.5 projection is that upper dashed blue line. But for Inuvik, I also projected an extrapolation of the 30 year moving average trend. And you see that it lines up quite well with the RCP 8.5 projection. For Inuvik then, that's what I chose to do, was just to assume a linear extrapolation of what we've already observed for climate. On this slide, you see that this doesn't work for Taktayaktak. The linear extrapolation would seem to underpredict what is expected to occur. So I actually used it, the RCP 8.5 projection. For Tsikachik, there's no climate data in, for the community, so I used Inuvix projections. Okay, so now this slide basically summarizes the site characteristics for the eight buildings that we looked at. 
there's basic information in terms of the year of construction, and then that salinity value that I talked about earlier. That's provided here for each of the eight sites based on the geotechnical information that we were able to find. And then the next column provides mean annual ground temperature. That was assumed at the time of the building design and that came from geotechnical information we could collect. The next column is what I've determined to be the mean annual ground temperature today. For about four of the, the sites, that's based on actual data and then the others are interpreted from other nearby sites and interpreted from the general findings of my review. I will note that for the Western Arctic Research Centre, you can see that the temperature monitoring cables have stopped collecting data as of 2015. So the data there is a little bit older. Then I applied that warming to the sites as suggested in the previous slides to come up with a serviceability limit. Now that could be defined any of several ways. One way is that there's a desire to get a 50 year uh, service life out of a building. So if that was determined to be practical, then that becomes a serviceability limit. But if um, permafrost was expected to reach the onset of thaw before a 50 year service life, then that became the limit. So it's kind of the earliest of the 50 year service life or when we anticipate the onset of perma permafrost thaw. The last column indicates what I've estimated to be the mean annual ground temperature uh, at that serviceability limit time. Just one comment on that. The CSA guideline suggests that as a first approximation, you can assume that the permafrost will warm in step with increases in air temperature. And that's what I've done. I have previously conducted a review for Inuvik and found that that's actually a reasonable assumption to date. Uh, so past warming has been reflected in permafrost warming in Inuvik. So I've carried that assumption forward for the purpose of my review. So now this slide summarizes the, summer, the findings from my review in the context of pile capacity. A couple of things to note here. We did not analyze each and every pile under the buildings, but we analyzed quite a few of them. Associated engineering helped me here because we interpreted the design information. Usually the loads were provided, but we had to revise those loads to basically take out factors of safety and to try and get an estimate of what the true actual loads on the piles are. For the purpose of estimating settlement, we were trying to figure out what the realistic loads were. The term for that is service loads and associated engineering determined the service loads for me. We considered two types of loads the sustained loading. I guess you might think of that as dead load. And then there's the short term loads. That could be anything from wind load to snow load. For the purpose of this review, I assumed that sustained loads were all were there all the time and that short term loads or temporary loads were in place for four months out of each year. The second last column again shows that serviceability limit that we determined in the last slide. And then the last column shows the estimated settlement at that serviceability limit. This is the maximum that I got for each of those pot or each of those buildings that were reviewed. Now uh, we'll, we'll talk about the overall conclusions from the study, but one kind of falls out from that previous slide. You look at the settlements and they're not really huge. So the first conclusion is that there is generally some resiliency in the ad-freeze piles in Inuvik. Five of the buildings are expected to reach a service life of about 50 years. The one exception is the Western Arctic Research Center. And that was fundamentally because uh, it simply had warmer ground temperatures at 2015. And um, projecting those forward, I just don't know if it's going to reach a 50 year service life. I'll speak to that more in the recommendations. But from this primary conclusion of general resiliency, you can infer that buildings in communities with colder permafrost should generally be resilient. And then buildings in communities with expected warmer permafrost, such as a clavic, may not be as resilient. Another finding for me was that the capacity really revolves around the, gr around the ground temperature. The loads are somewhat less important. As long as the permafrost remains frozen, there's enough conservatism in design that the loads are not going to cause too many problems. But once the permafrost reaches the onset of thaw, 
that's when you can expect things to change fairly quickly. With the analysis methodology we used, I feel there is good confidence in the pile capacity part of it and in the creep settlement calculations. They are conservative, but I think they represent reasonably what we could expect to occur. I have less confidence in the predicted ground temperature response to the warming air temperatures. I say in the study that it was rather simplistically handled. I assumed it would change in step with air temperature, but I think that if we're concerned about a particular building, we'd want to do better than that. The other point I'd like to note is that at this level of review, I could only really look at average ground temperatures, but under a given building, the ground temperature will vary. You'd expect it to be coolest under the center of a building, but it will be warmer under the perimeter. And that variability hasn't been considered at this stage. So now then, what are the recommendations? The first recommendation is that because of, of all the buildings I looked at, the Western Arctic Research Center is potentially the most vulnerable. I think that it's important to get the ground temperature collection data collection restored there. The cables are still there. It's just that the data loggers are not performing effectively at this time. So I think it's practical and it's important to get that restored. Because it's considered the least resilient, I think the Western Arctic Research Center warrants further review. So I had recommended that the service loads of the remaining 69 piles, the ones that we hadn't assessed to date, also be checked. That recommendation was approved and that work has been done. I mentioned that I felt that the ground temperature response to climate change was ra rather simplistically handled. So I recommended that thermal analysis be done to approve confidence in that aspect of it. My suggestion would be to do this initially to the Western Arctic Research Center and see if it validates the simplistic assumptions I've made and simply to provide more site-specific information for that particular building. I have a couple of recommendations geared towards Tuk to Yuk Tuk because they are planning an addition on that school. The school is currently about 30 years old, but they would like to extend that out, certainly to a minimum of 50 years, which would bring it out to 2040. But then they would like to get 50 years out of an addition, which brings it out to 2070. It looks to me that the foundation under the existing school could potentially remain serviceable out to 2070. And for that reason, I suggested that we look at it a little harder and that individual piles under the existing school um, be assessed to identify if there are piles that need special attention to help them um, make it out to that uh, 27, 2070 timeframe. And lastly, in conjunction with the addition construction, they should install long-term ground temperature monitoring instrumentation so that we can see what's going on there. Acknowledgements are due here to the Government of the Northwest Territories, Department of Infrastructure, firstly for commissioning the work, but secondly for allowing me to speak about it. They also provided quite a bit of the background information that I reviewed for this study. But I also wanted to acknowledge Tetratech because they had lots of records and they were willing to let me basically mine their files to collect background information to help me with this review. I mentioned Associated Engineering helped me with the structural aspects of the study, so I thank them for that. I also wanted to acknowledge the Government of the Northwest Territories, uh, the regional office in Inuvik. In particular, Ramesh Koirala, he uh, made himself available on a Saturday morning to allow me to go and uh, take some temperature measurements under the government buildings in Inuvik, uh, the multi-use building and the record center. At this point, I'll conclude. I have provided some contact information on this slide so that if you do have any questions arising from this presentation, you can contact me there.